Scott Pollock. Remember the name? Scotty P is someone that will always be a huge part of hashtag history. The first ever Academy winner, aged just 16, he bagged man of the match at the Wembley Cup, going toe to toe with Steven Gerrard. When I was subbed on, I was like, right, this is it. No need to be nervous anymore. But his prodigious talent wasn't appreciated by every ex-professional he faced up against. And he basically lost his head with you because you were too good. And he didn't, he like, he, he elbowed you. I'm pretty sure he elbowed you. After hashtag, Scott signed pro terms at Northampton Town, faced Wayne Rooney in the FA Cup, won the club's young player of the season and helped them to League One. His journey then took him to the highest tiers of non-league, scoring for fun at Boston and securing a deal at an ambitious Yeovil town. But all wasn't as it seemed. Being really honest, the club made it sort of aware that we don't think it's going to be sustainable. With speculations over different ownerships and stuff, you, you don't know where, you, where your job lies. If you suddenly go part-time and it's not enough money, then you're going to have to get another job. Yeah, it's probably one of the trickiest situations I've been in as a player in my career. With injury issues behind him, Scott is raring to go again, eager to prove he's got what it takes to make it back to the football league. But what has he learned in his early years in football? And what lessons can he share as a young player making his way in the game? How does he think a football club should be run? All right, mate, how you doing? And welcome back to How to Run a Football Club. I've got a very special guest with me today. Not to say that my brother Seb isn't special. What? He's more of a regular. But the man next to him, Scott Bloody Pollock, is back. Remember the name. If you don't know, and you would have seen a little bit about Scott's career and our little opening there, this man is a man that's very close to our heart, Seb. Absolutely. We found him on the streets of, of Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> in the favelas. <laughs> what was it? Actually, it was London, really, wasn't it? It was a trial you came to in London. Yeah, yeah, the back streets of London. Back streets yeah, of somewhere like up, yeah. South London or somewhere, I think it was. <laughs> and uh, 16 years of age and won the Academy Series, which is like one of the best projects we do. But also that first year was probably the best year of yeah, it. magical. We had like 20,000 applicants for that season. Um, which is mad. And so many good players probably that like, I didn't even invite to trials because mm -hmm. I just couldn't go for them all. Um, but obviously Scott not only came down, impressed it, impressed us, won it. And then, you know, not just because of that, but because of the talent this young man has since then has gone on to, to create an honest little football career in professional football. And uh, we want to talk about that, basically. I want to do a little bit of a recap in everything that's happened post hashtag. We'll talk a little bit about the, the glory days, as I like to call them, and really the lowest level of football you have ever played and will ever play. But for me, they're the glory the days. highest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, I mean, we played the same team, yeah, 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 not yeah, all yeah. of us three. Absolutely, we did. That is yeah. mad. And uh, that's the beauty of football, isn't it? But uh, yeah, and then just find out, you know, this is ultimately how to run a football club. So as, mu as much as I want to catch up with you, I also want to dip into what you've learned about good football teams, because you've played for a few now in, in the sort of last four or five years. And what makes it good from a player perspective? You know, so it's our first active, you know, contracted player here on the podcast. And we want to, we want to have a little chat. But first things first, how the hell are you? I'm all good. It's good to be back. It is. Good to be back. Good to see you both. Absolutely. I'm doing okay. You've never really been away from hashtag. You, you've been very good at that, I have to say. You've always come back and supported us, you know, at, whether it's at games. You came back and helped us in the other hashtag Academy series as well, which is massive because you were a massive, you know, like, example for those people that are entering i basically want to be the next scott pollock and we yeah. we have milked that haven't we like oh, how yeah. many times have we gone <laughs> yeah. like be the next scott pollock i mean we, we as might have many other one. youtubers with some of the titles of thumbnails well, yeah, over yeah, the years yeah. as well but you've been in some big youtube videos big not videos. even associated with us as well like you've done some massive stuff as yeah. well which is great um so okay you're currently this like we're gonna go like in chrono chronological order at some point but just to give a, a overview of the current situation Yeovil, mm -hmm. which is a massive club, Huge club. Yeah. where you're currently playing. Uh, National League South right now, top of it. You're currently injured at the moment. You haven't mm -hmm. played this season, but what's the current situation? Yeah, so some people probably would have seen on my Insta. Gave a little update about five weeks ago. I had um, surgery on my knee to get rid of a little floating bone, which was causing me quite a bit of pain. So, so how does that happen? Like, how did, When did you find out there was a floating bone in there? And how does that even become a thing to be fair not for a while really yeah yeah after the season finished i was like right i need to get this sorted we'll have an mri yeah seen a specialist didn't get picked up they didn't I see it they didn't know what didn't it was there it no it didn't tell me and then seen another specialist didn't tell me you yeah. just assume don't you that I you know. see a specialist yeah. and they're going to sort that, you out that's been yeah. the most frustrating thing is that scott you know he's not been able to play much football this year as he obviously wants to and all because of this little bit of bone. Yeah. You just don't know it's there. You go and see people, you think yeah. you're going to come up with injuries. 
some people think, you know, what's going on with this knee? Don't know what's happening with it. Then you get the MRI all clear. What the hell's going on there? Yeah. Mm. And eventually to find out there's just this tiny bit of bone. Quite a simple procedure you had as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, they just went in, took it out, took this bone out and then just yeah. sewed you up. And that's, yeah, that's yeah. sort it out. He did say it was going to be a bit more complicated, but it turned out it was easier than expected. Right. So recovery time is probably two or three weeks less than what it would have been. Okay. Yeah, I'm fascinated with, with the act of buying a player or being sold or whatever and what you go through in that. You know, so, I mean, Seb, I know you've been a big part of it. So how did it all happen? Yeah, well, look, Scott was absolutely smashing it at Boston. And there was a lot of interest in Scott to go and move on to a higher level and play. There's opportunities all over the place. International offers as well. Really? Um, yeah, it's, it's a very exciting time. I mean, Scott was playing in midfield and he was top goal scorer at one point in the league for Boston. I mean, so, I've got the stats. Stats uh, are unbelievable. 16 goals in 32 games. Like, that yeah. is outrageous for a striker, really. And you weren't a striker. Like and you, you're on set pieces. I know you got a good free kick on you as well. Are you taking penalties? Pens as well. Does yeah. help. To help yeah. the stats. You, it's the guy yeah. you want in your FPL team. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. right now. Yeah. He's the first name on the yeah. team sheet in that. Um, so yeah, look, there was a lot of interest, and um, Yeovil obviously been a massive club. They it looked very much as though they were being taken over by yeah, new owners, remember, yeah. and the Ugla family were to be taken over at Yeovil. Yeah. So there was a, an agent who was representing Yeovil looking to buy some players in. Yeovil was sort of towards the relegation zone, looking to sort of solidify their league position. And we're looking at Scott as one of those players. Our first thought was, look, could be unbelievable, but should we wait and see how they get on and make sure they stay up first? You enjoy yeah. it at Boston, doing really well. Boston didn't want to let you go. Towards Coming towards the end of the season as well, so it didn't feel like the right time. But then there was, a, let's be honest about it, there was an opportunity that came in from Yeovil that was just probably like an amazing opportunity to join a massive club, be a part of something, new ownership, Yeovil's history. I mean, we know a little bit about it through... through um, Nathan Smith. Yes. Yeah, so, we, we have Yeovil's record appearance maker at Hashtag right yeah. now, you know, um, and he's been unbelievable this and year. And I actually spoke mate. to Nathan at the time. I spoke to him and I said, like, what did you say? Like, amazing club, amazing people, great place. Uh, he obviously knew a lot about it. Um, so it seemed like a really good time. There's an amazing opportunity to go down there uh, for Scott to play for a huge club amongst this period, difficult period in the club's history, but on the dawn of this new yeah. new world. Yeah, there's, mm. we're spending a lot of money, an exciting project to be part of, yes. thinking about getting back into League Two maybe and all that, mm -hmm. like, not that year because it was a relegation crap at that yeah. point, but the season after that. What goes through your head when, I mean, people don't know, you're like Northampton-based, like born and bred, that like, sort of area. Mm -hmm. Um Obviously, Boston. What was the journey to Boston like? Were you, were you, you weren't staying in Boston, were you? No, no, we're, we're part-time. So it was yeah. two nights a week training and obviously game on a Saturday. So it was a bit of commuting today. What was, what was the drive? About an hour and 40 to the stadium. Okay. I mean, they trained up in Doncaster. So right. A, bit a couple further. of hours, yeah. Okay. And then what happened? What, so when you're suddenly, when a Yeovil come in the conversation, was there ever a conversation about whether you could do that staying at home? Is it, no, you need to move to Yeovil? What does that look like? What, that would yeah, be the first experience for that for you because obviously been at Northampton before it's down the road. Yeah, I know you, you kind of take it for granted when you're at Northampton and I'm 15 minutes away from the training ground and you've got players coming in from everywhere and they're moaning about the travelling and you're thinking... Sounds right to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. But yeah, when they're obviously a full-time team like Yeovil, I know that it's a commitment. Yeah. So either move down there or even go down there Monday, Tuesday, come back on your day off. Right. But you know, you're down there early on a Thursday yeah. and a Friday. So, yeah, it's a lot to a lot to think about when you're still quite young like myself and yeah. you're moving away from home. Do the, the club help time. with stuff like that? Like, do they, is there like digs you can go in or is it like they might say, oh, here's a good area you should look into or you some players you could live with or something like that? Yeah, to begin with, they were helpful with getting me a place with a couple of the other new boys nice. signed as well at the same time. So you get like a relocation it's like uni but not having to do any of the work yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get like a relocation allowance as well yeah. within, within a contract and that's the biggest thing is that because like, Scott did have a number of opportunities to where he could go because mm. the size of the club and because of how exciting you know the expectation was what was going to happen this big influx of capital into the club and get the club right back up the league system mm. and Scott to be like a big part of that the new owners like really wanted him like made a real beeline for Scott to be part of that team um, but all wasn't as it seemed sadly, um, because despite the fact that the new owners were like unveiled at the stadium, like we went down there and met them all like there in the director's room, the actual transaction never got completed. And this fascinates um, me because absolutely, like, you know, we talk so much about how we try and run hashtag super sustainably and like, we, you know, we'd never do anything like that would just be a bad use of money, basically. Like how does someone, and this is my understanding of it, tell me if I'm wrong, but how does someone that's going to potentially buy a club start spending money at that club without owning the club. Isn't that just 
Madness. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. We need I've to get a no podcast idea. on with I mean, the fans. We should probably should. <laughs> Matt, maybe he's up for it because, you know, he, he likes going on socials and stuff. And, you know, he's obviously now gone on. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute, I guess. But basically, the, there was something that happened. Like, there's a lot of people who tried to buy Yeovil in the past. It seemed as though there was some detail around one side of the contract through the stadium that just didn't go. Something like that. I don't know the ins and outs of it. So it's not fair for me to speculate. But, like... The Uglers are going to game. They're making multiple signings. They're in the office every day. They're they're all fans are like purposes. clapping yeah. them at games and stuff. Right, they're, they're, they're they're running the club, yeah. right? Uh, and they're spending money. Uh, so Scott signs, goes down, passes medical, signs on the dotted line, starts going to training. Like it's all happening. And then all of a sudden, you start hearing these things on social media that you're still waiting for the previous owner to release something. It doesn't release, and all this stuff. And you're like, what's going on? And then one day, it just turns out that it's, the deal's off. That they're not buying the club anymore. Um, so the person that's brought you to the club, the person that sort of sold, yeah. not sold you the dream, but like sort of said to you, this is the project and we're building. And it's got to be said yeah. that the, as far as I understand it, that was not their doing. Like they're actually down there spending the money, spending yeah, their own well, time just, and effort. wouldn't spend the money. So it seemed as it. though the previous owner, who's no longer the owner, to make it more complicated, basically stopped that deal going through. So therefore the Ugler family had no alternative but to move on. They lost the investment that they've spoken about they've, they've, they've spent. Um, and... The club's left now with an owner that was trying to sell, with new owners that are not buying it. Scott's just going to sign for the club. Yeah, so what's going through your head at this point, Scott? Because you, you were playing at this point that the results weren't going the way you needed to, in terms of the team to stay yeah. in the league. And you've you've like, the guy who's bought me here is not here anymore. What Where does that leave me sort of thing? Yeah, it's probably one of the trickiest situations I've been in as a player in my career. Because at the, the business end of the season, yeah, with all the stuff going on, above you with the managers and with the owners and stuff like that. It's it's hard to focus on and what needs to be done on the pitch. And it does reflect what happens on the Absolutely. pitch. Is there a lot of chat about it, training and stuff? Yeah, Everyone's it's, like, it's hard no, not no. to, well, it's hard to just ignore it. It's, no, you can't, it's yeah. what everyone's thinking and you kind of have to get on with it. But at the same time, it's hard to just focus on your football when other stuff's going on. Yeah, and the other massive, you. there's a massive... Uh, ramification of a team getting relegated from that league as well, which yeah. is a lot of teams don't stay pro yeah. when they drop into the National League South. Yeah. So what's the status of, of Yeovil now in terms of the amount of training you're doing? Yeah, they're still full-time. Still full-time. Yeah, so yeah. how many teams do you reckon are full-time in that league right now? I think National League South is probably only maybe three or four. Yeah, because it's a league we know quite well because, so we've got Averley, who's our women's uh, landlords. Um, we used to be in the same league as them and the men there in that league. They're going quite well they're in the playoff spots. Uh, got Chumps for City in that league. We've got Jermaine Francis and Ben Brooks now. Got Braintree, who we beat in the Essex Cup. Also knocked us out of the FA Cup a few years ago, so we got a bit of revenge there. And there's a, a, quite a few teams that came down from that league into our yeah. league this year, like Dulwich, Hamlet, Concord Rangers. And that, for me, has always been the big step up. Like, we kind of always aim to get to step three mm -hmm. and then sort of reassess because we know how much ex more expensive it gets. But then once you go from National League South to National League, yeah. where most teams are pro, yeah. and it's like, it's basically the fifth professional league, isn't it? Yeah. That's like, so when you come down out of that league, it's a massive change. Massive, and like, yeah. you know, it gets talked about in the Premier League when teams get relegated, but it's the same for every league. Or people are going to lose their jobs, you know, who's, yeah. it's not just the players, it's yeah. the coaches, it's people at the stadium. So mm. what is that like going for a relegation? Yeah, it's, it's a different one with that. Obviously, like you say, it's, it's a massive step down. And as a player, you don't know whether you're going to be part-time yeah. or whether you're going to have to get another job. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of the boys' contracts ran out that season as well. So it's always more difficult to get another contract somewhere else when yeah. you've just been relegated from True. a national league and with speculations over different ownerships and stuff you you don't know where you where your job lies if you suddenly go part time and it's not enough money then you're going to have to get another job yeah so a new so a new owner comes in so then another so another local businessman comes in and does buy the club uh, although we're led to believe and like we haven't got a chance to get to know him that well sadly um is that it's not going to be the same level of resources made available to Yeovil. And then Scott's been put on this contract from a, in a different regime, as well as a few other players. And being really honest, the club made it sort of aware that we don't think it's going to be sustainable. Um, so look, Scott might want money to find another club, you know. Yeah. And the shame is there that Scott really at that point is thinking, right, well, it's annoying. But going back down to, you know, still a decent level, get a chance to be the hero, be the main man get the club back to where it's just come down from. Um, and then with the current injury, uh, has not been able to do that. And it's so frustrating, it. isn't it? Because even though you've gone down, it's like, right, I've just scored 16 goals in this level the year yeah. before, not even yeah. a full season. Yeah. Like, let me at them sort of thing. Yeah, I'll show yeah, you. Yeah. We'll get back up. Like, no yeah. problem. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Hold my beer. But 
the injuries, that's what happens, right? When you get an injury, and then especially it's a time of turbulent, turbulent time at the club of transition where there's, mm-hmm. you know, new owners coming in, whatever. All you want to do is get on the pitch and just show them what you can do. Yeah. You know, and especially it's so much more annoying, I imagine, when the person who knows what you can do is the guy who bought you to come because he's the fan, obviously, the, uh, the uh, uh, ugly guy, because he must have been like, seeing what you're doing at Boston and he's not there anymore. Yeah. So like, you haven't been able to almost show that, the That's the thing, real, the uh, that obviously, what happened there was it must have been a very difficult time for everyone involved in the club. Yeah. And I think a lot of the people that were brought in from that era, that brief period where the Uglers were there, sort of gets put in a different box to the club. It's like, oh, you know, it gets a little bit, there's a little bit of arm's length between it. Mm. I think there's been a factor of that this year as well. Um, uh, the Uglers have gone on and, and bought uh, a new club now. They're running York City. Okay. Um, but we've not had any discussion with them really ever, ever since that period. The focus has always been on Scott just doing what you want to do, play football, right? Yeah. Just want to go yeah. and play football. I think that was what was most frustrating is, I guess people didn't understand this kind of what injury it was. Yeah, yeah, you see yeah. me playing and then yeah. you see me not playing one week. It's like, well, it can't be anything too wrong with you because you're playing one game, 90 minutes, and then you're not playing the next. So are you just like picking and choosing when you're playing or is it genuine injury? Yeah, which... that's the worst thing about football, right? Is that the fans are often the most uninformed people. Yes, they care yeah. the most, yeah. but they don't know the most. And so yeah. they'll be like, they don't know if it's like a, a character thing or if it's like, which obviously we know it isn't because yeah. we weren't, you know, Scott and never would be that case. But people haven't got any information, so they just guess. They just make stuff up. Yeah. And it's like, okay, yeah. that's why I miss things like this are good for now. This is one of the big things that's changed in football, I'd say, in the last sort of 10 years is footballers can just come and tell you how it is. You don't have to yeah. be hiding behind the whoever, like the club or whatever. So I think um, that's good. And, you know, the good news is it seems like the, the light's the end of the tunnel. This injury is going to be over in pretty soon yeah. and you can get back to playing, which we all want to see. Um, let's talk about some of the, your earlier playing memories and, like, I want to go through your career because it is you know, it's still a long hopefully long career left to go and a lot more trials and tribulations. But what you've done already is amazing, especially if you think about the kind of inception of it, because like, so you were at academies growing up, weren't you? But you were a goalkeeper. Yeah. Is that so, right? Yeah. So never like officially like signed as an academy player. Okay. So like players, when they're like six and seven, they actually get signed and yeah, they yeah, yeah. Just progress through the whole years of academy. But I was never one of them. So you were like just... Sunday you league. You were, was, uh, and you, but weren't you involved with something to do with Leicester at some yeah, point? Yeah, yeah. So that was... They had like an academy and then they got like an elite. Yeah, the elite. The stuff, elite yeah. underneath, which I was but probably I, 12, 12, 13. As a keeper? Both. So Wow. What a combo. I know. Some some <laughs> days, because it's, it's obviously not the academy and it's not as professionally run. Yeah. Still like very good level. And obviously these players have kind of maybe been at academies before and they've not re-signed with some. So you get a, a good mix of players. Yeah. But some uh, games, because you have games like every half term, uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. And sometimes a keeper wouldn't turn up. You should go. So I think the coach knew I was kind of like a bit of both. Oh, I've seen what you can do. It's like, weird, but... I've, you know, he's the sort of guy that's just good at everything. Like, I've he's taken up golf a little bit in the last few years. He played together. Like, he's decent at that compared to how new he is to the sport. I remember the moment where I knew you just one of them guys. You know where it was? <laughs> Jersey. You think about backflips? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just soaking down, pissing with rain. We're going for a... Why did we go for a walk? We went for a walk. So it was like five or six of us. And you just stood on this like wall in your slippers. In sliders, yeah. And, and you just did yeah, a backflip. On concrete. Yeah. I was like, what? What on the hell are So many things could have gone wrong there. I was just like, just one of them guys that can just do stuff. I was just like, oh, yeah. okay. No, I mean, that's, for me, that's one of the things that separates like the, the elite yeah. Uh, athletes when the people that are just like half decent is they just can do it. I mean, Alex's brother is the same. You know, he's in he was in the UFC, but he's so good at everything. everything you know, yeah, any yeah. sport. He's, he's really good at football, and he never played football. Yeah, it's like cool. it's just so annoying. Mm. Yeah, it's so annoying. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you've certainly got that trait, and we were always so impressed with you. But I think what's really interesting is first of all the fact that you weren't in those academies growing up, right? Yeah. Like it, it's a massive uh, like be some most motivation for people watching yeah, out absolutely. there. absolutely. That you don't, you know, if someone hasn't believed in you yet or given you that opportunity, don't stop because 16, you say it's fairly late really to sort yeah. of come into it and it wasn't a straightforward path either. So you applied for this, this series, come mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were the best player on the first day. We all knew it. I don't think we necessarily knew you were definitely going to win the show on the first I day. Did. 
Do you think? Yeah, well, you did say remember the name Scott Pollock yeah, famously. Yeah, yeah. I got his name wrong. Big step. Yeah. <laughs> I got his name. Scott Pollock. <laughs> I, 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 I had a friend. Uh, so I, rememberable. The, 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 the reason being, I don't know if I've ever spoken about the reason being, is that I played all through uni with a guy called Scott Perkins. Of course you did. Yeah. Um, shout out Scott, Scotty, Scotty Scott Perkins. Pippin. And uh, Scotty Perkins was also called Scotty P. Was so when player? I got the interview, I first said, I remember the name, Scotty Perkins. I, I was obviously talking about yeah. Scott, yeah. but I said Scotty Perkins. Thankfully, we cut that bit yeah. out of the edit. We, got, might have, we might have. I don't know if we, we might have that rush there. If we do, we'll put it. It? Yeah, um, yeah, it was just standout, wasn't it? From the from one of the youngest yeah. in the competition, if not the youngest. Yeah, and the, the other thing because we did a couple of trial days. Yeah. So I think it was the first day you came down to us. We yeah. hadn't done some of the others yet, so we didn't know who else we were going to find. But then we get like later on in the series, we start doing the sort of physical and technical tests, and you just start scoring free kicks and things. Yeah. We're like, okay, this, this guy's built different. Um, the backflips in the corner flag. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, and then you, <laughs> obviously there was a whole. We we won't get into that series. It's all on YouTube. If you want to watch it? Don't yeah, forget. Yeah. It's actually on my channel, not the hashtag channel. So the same channel you're watching this on, um, series one. But there was a whole thing with your 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 co finalist Jack Durkin and this whole mm. press ups thing, and that yeah. probably actually took a bit of the shine off because you you would have won anyway. I think. But no disrespect to Jack, I think mm. that the, the fans knew you were that level. Yeah. But because he had this whole thing about his press ups and this nonsense, it took a bit of the shine off it, I think, which is a shame. But certainly it didn't long term. Off the back of that, you come and join our first team. It's worth saying we took about seven or eight players from that series in the end because you didn't have to be as good as Scott to improve our yeah. team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but so people ask me a lot about you. They say like, did we know you were that good? And I always say like, I knew you were way better than anyone else we did had played for us for sure. But I don't think any of us could know what level you go to because it's such an opinion-based thing. Yeah, it's about yeah. opportunities, right? Yeah. I think, you know, we, we certainly helped with that, but I, I never take credit for it because you have to go and perform and do the things you do. And you've there's loads of other routes which we'll get on down to that you were doing off your own back as well. But for me, the big one that I always think about is the Wembley Cup. You know, we had this massive game, 34,000 people, the biggest Wembley Cup there ever was, third one. Uh, and... You know, I'm going to make this a little bit about me here because I like to. It's my claim to fame when it comes to you, Scott. <laughs> yeah. Is I made the decision not to start you in the game. Yeah. People, actually, I remember the conversation. People actually, ask me I about did. this. So they're like, why did you not start Scott Pollock in that yeah. final? Bear in mind, yeah, you know, it's not, yeah, you know, there's so much riding on these games. I know yeah. it isn't a professional football game, but yeah. for us, it's like our lives. Like, we yeah. don't, yeah, we've got all these people watching, you know, millions of people in the, we don't want to lose, we want to win. Why did I not start our best player? Because you were our best player. And I even said to you when I didn't start you, you're our best player. Yeah. And it was basically a combination of um, people have been there longer, which is like half of it. And it's like the whole, you know, do the right thing by the players. We had a sort of set. We had, a, we had played a very functional 4-4-2. And like that, the, we didn't really know where your best position was at that point either. We knew we could play you anywhere. It wouldn't be a problem. So I was like, who do I bring in for Scott? And I thought, actually, you are also 16 years old and there's also 34,000 people out there. And weirdly, I've actually played at Wembley a couple of times at this point. And I was probably, I did, I'm not saying for any second you yeah. were nervous, but I can yeah. imagine a world where you would where he be. quickly proved he wasn't. No, exactly, yeah. clearly. What I thought is, take the pressure off him. Let's set the boys out there and then use Scott as, I knew we were going to do roll and roll off as well. Yeah. And, you know, we had Martin Keown as our manager. And I said to Martin, look, there's a few funny stories there where I was telling him to get Robbie Fowler off ASAP for Dan Brown and he was like Robbie Fowler I was like it's Dan Brown mate <laughs> but I said to him listen get this kid on as soon as you physically can don't wait just get him on as soon as a good time to do it he'll win us the game and I pulled Scott to one side and I knew Scott wouldn't be like annoyed because he's a pro and he's a very good attitude mm. but I wanted to make sure you didn't think it was an oversight and I was having a stink I was like no I think I know what I'm doing this Scott yeah. I said look and I hadn't said this to him before and I don't think I said it in any videos at this point but I said Scott look you're our best player everyone knows it you're going to win us this game. You're going to come off the bench really mm -hmm. soon. You're going to win yeah. us the game. Like, don't worry about not starting. It's, there's, there's a sort of idea there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what happens? He comes on and gets three assists, man of the match. So you're welcome, basically, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I, What's your memory of that? What's the your same as the <laughs> No, I remember I was fuming. I was absolutely <laughs> gutted. I was like, I'm leaving out. this club. So I can't even look. I can't even, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> se dons <laughs> where are they John weren't even born then were they <laughs> no they were around they oh, were yeah. around there for sure no no back then I was like yeah I wasn't even thinking about to be fair I'll probably turn up on the day not expecting to start anyway fair I was 16 I was like just enjoying the day yeah probably could have paid, played 10 minutes and been, been imagine buzzing. what, what yeah. a mayor that would have been yeah. Yeah. Keown probably would have done it as well if I hadn't insisted yeah, 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 he yeah, was, was getting definitely. a bit power hungry yeah. Keown I was like you don't know any of these players mate just let me tell you who's yeah. good anyway but the what was the actual day like for you in terms of when you did come on? Because it must have been amazing. Yeah, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a myriad of levels on the pitch. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. you got, I'm on there. You've got YouTubers who are just, you know, basic footballers. But then you've got Stephen Gerrard, 
And mm. Steven Gerrard, I think, quite quickly worked out you were a problem for them. And he was trying to get near you. Like he yeah. was. And, he, and this wasn't Steven Gerrard now. This was Steven Gerrard like six months post retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was unreal. Yeah, he was a joke. Yeah, um, but like, you have to pinch yourself because you're just like, you're, you, what, probably six months prior to that, you never, you just watched a few of us on YouTube yeah. and suddenly you're playing at Wembley. Yeah, it is weird to think, obviously, how quickly it kind of just all developed. But I've always said I was more nervous the moment we went up to went out to warm up mm. than actually me coming on. Mm. All the people there. I yeah. don't know why. It was just surreal, like actually yeah. being on the pitch, yeah, warming up and kind of seeing all these pros or ex-pros. And then when I was subbed on, I was like, right, this is it. Yeah. No need to be nervous anymore. It's like you've also seen everyone else. You're like, <laughs> this won't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what a moment! Like one of my most proudest things that we get to do in, in YouTube is when we get to find people like you. Like, and that's what one of the reasons we did that series. Like, we wanted to make a good series. Obviously, that's what we do. Really, that's what I do. You know, I tried to do on YouTube. I knew we could make our team better, but the most important thing was I wanted to. We were only getting to do this ridiculous stuff because of the viewers. So I was like, I actually want. It wasn't actually the second and third series because we found you. Mm. Second and third series turned into like let's really find some talent, and mm. we're now non-league team. Mm. Let's get better. But the first series was really about rewarding our viewers. We didn't know who we were going to find. And it's like, let's get some of them to come on these trips with us. And you, know, you came to Spain with us. We've got a great story. We should talk about what happened in Spain with Scott, actually. Um, I don't know if you remember it, but I remember it. I'm and then uh, I'll yeah. oh, well, bring it up about? in a minute. But then, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, the idea. Of, it's like we talk about Stampy, who works here now. He came for the same series as you. You know, and he's worked with us for like four or five years. And there's, there's a load of other people that have come through. Oh, it. the ref thing. But yeah, so I'm really proud of that. So fast forward, let's talk about Spain. So we do a little La Liga tour. We go and play Real Oviedo and Ibar's staff teams. You know, like, again, real mix of some of them coaches, maybe a couple of ex-players in there, but also like the social media guys. Like we won both games fairly comfortably. You know, it wasn't, it was a good level of opposition. We handpicked them well, Sebi. Mm -hmm. um, but do you remember what happened in the Ibar game? We played Ibar and they had an assistant manager or assistant coach, whatever he was, who played a proper level. He played La Liga. He was maybe pushing... I don't know. He was in between 40 and 50 somewhere, yeah. I'd say. He wasn't under 40, but he wasn't over 50. Let's say 45. And he basically lost his head with you because you were too good. And he didn't, he like, he, he elbowed you. I'm pretty sure he elbowed you. Yeah. I, I vaguely, I remember some in between. Because you're unconscious. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we can choose whether we leave this in the video or not. But at the time, we were trying to look after our relationship. So we, we took it out of the video because it, was, it wasn't just that he elbowed you. There was yeah. like, it all went mad. Everyone kicked off. They were basically mm -hmm. saying that we were too good, I think, and we'd bought too good players for it. Yeah. And it's like, you're Ibar. You can turn up with anyone. We don't yeah. know if you turn up with your academy boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it happened in Atlanta in yeah. America. They oh, turned yeah, up with their absolutely. under 23s and started yeah. killing us. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've just bought our Sunday League boys, basically, plus this kid we found. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it kicked off and they the absolutely lost his head, their guy. I can't remember his name, but if I can remember, we'll get it up now and name and shame him. And we had to take it out of the video because um, Made him look bad. basically it was a La Liga-sponsored yeah. thing and they were like, this makes Ibar look terrible. But that's another case of you yeah. getting in people's heads. From being I think, too was good. it him that was like fuming and then took his shirt off and then threw yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we, we probably yeah, have yeah. the footage somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Just lost the plot. I do remember it a little bit, yeah. But it's not about him. It's about Scotty P this episode. So post that, you actually only played, I think, 13 games for Hashtag, which is mad. You know, yeah. You're know, you a club legend. And until you actually have dropped out of the Hall of Fame now, I think. Mm. The, there's not the Hall of Fame, so the, the best 11 we do. And that's purely on appearances. I think you'd yeah. be in there on ability that's, for sure. Fair enough. Though. And it's fan voted. Yeah. I think you're on the bench. I'm out as well, mate. Yeah, we, we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I made the first team. <laughs> um, but uh, I think any of us are in here. <laughs> yeah, I think fair you're enough. on the bench to be fair, Sebi. Oh, no, you're definitely I'm clinging are. on. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously, we've got players who play like 100 odd games now. Yeah. But it says a lot about it that you were in the first uh, fan voted best 11 for 13 games to your name. And there's mm -hmm. people that have played 80, 90 that weren't in there. Um, but you only played 13 games and I mean your debut was at the Emirates, I think, was your first game. Yeah. Yeah, which was again amazing. And um then what was happening simultaneous to this, which people may not know, people outside of Northampton might not know this, is you were enrolled in the Northampton football and education program. Yeah. So what is that? Tell us what that is. Yeah, so when I was well, when I first joined hashtag, is it May, June time? Yeah, it would have been twenty like seventeen, yeah. GCSE year, I think. Or year after GCSEs. Mm. So I was like Sunday league. And hashtag. Yeah. That was it. Sunday league hashtag. That's my football. And then obviously I needed to do something after school. So in the summer I applied for this football and education program. It's basically like football and college, which is a dream really. You yeah, play yeah. football every day with your mates and you still get a B Tech degree out of it. So yeah. I was doing that, uh, doing the preseason with them, 
which is all under Northampton as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you're still associated with Northampton, but you're just basically the level below the youth team. Yeah. So it was a dream for me. It was like, mm. right, how they pitched it as well was you can get into the youth team. Yeah. And I think a lot of other people are like, okay, I just want to do this because I don't know what else to do. Mm. Or I saw that. That stood out to me. I was like, right, here's a pathway into the youth team. Yeah. Which is what I want. Stay with Northampton, smash it here, and I can get into the youth team. That yeah. was my that was my main aim. Well, because that's the thing with the, we we actually were going to do one ourselves, and we only didn't do it because of COVID. Unfortunately, we couldn't do the trials we needed, and it kind of got parked after that. But ultimately, often those things do sell that dream to players, don't yeah. they? they? Go, I want to come and enroll, and you might play for us one day. Ninety nine percent of the players are never going to do it, and I don't think anyone had ever done it in Northampton before. No, but you, again, just like you, gave us this. You could be the next Scott Pollock. Yeah. You gave Northampton and probably every other, uh, the same sort of education program around the country, the perfect poster boy. Like you could be the next Scott Pollock again. Come and do our course and you might play in League Two, League One. Like, it's not yeah. just the youth to be going. So ended up. That's what I'm in, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you surpassed yeah. Their, their best dreams of just yeah. getting into the youth team. You mm. ended up with a, a fully signed pro at Northampton. Yeah. And you were there coming through League Two. They got promoted to League One. You know, I mean, let's talk about your time at Northampton in general because... We were just so proud, weren't we, seeing all that Amazing. kick off. And the main one for me was, was the FA Cup against Derby. Yeah. Wayne Rooney and Scotty P sharing. The two of remember the, the two name. Remember yeah. the name. The, the collaboration. Amazing. Yeah. What yeah. was that like playing against Rooney? Yeah, that was another surreal sort of that's playing against a pro, like we've played against the pros like when they've washed up. Yeah. No, it's yeah. harsh. Not washed up. When <laughs> yeah. they've retired. Some of them are washed up. Yeah, some of them. Yeah. Most of them in good nick. Uh whereas Rooney was literally Oh, it was still a joke. Yeah. 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 Less in the home game at Northampton. I guess. Oh, it was a re and, was it a replay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, played them twice. The first, not leg as such, but the first game was at home at Northampton. And he kind of, he didn't shine too much then. But the second leg, he was like back to his usual self. Because he would only been about 33, because he retired fairly young, mm. really. I think he'd been about 33, 34 yeah, at the time. Yeah. So what year was that, that game? 2020, early 2020. 2020, okay. So I'm trying to work. So it's like less, yeah. so it's like two and a half years since. You applied for Hashtag Academy and yeah. did all those YouTube games. Mm. You're playing against Wayne Rooney. And you yeah. would have been, what, eight, 19, 18, 19? I, I was 18 then. Yeah, Man, that's crazy, isn't yeah. it? Wild. What, what a trajectory. And it's so fascinating, the fact that you, this has come about late, really. Like, mm. it is late, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, do you, why do you think teams hadn't looked at you? Do you think you improved late? Do you think you blossomed late? Like, why weren't you in the Academy set up? So Playing with not... dog just rubs off on you. Oh. Right? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he taught me a lot, to be fair, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out, man! <Manjdor. laughs> yeah, I don't know. It is because I'd never say I just suddenly became like good at everything in football. It was always like a slow progression. But were you were you playing at school level? Like, were yeah, you, I was uh, always playing. Were you the best player in the year? Would you say? Well, I was. The football was never like the main thing when I was like really young. Like primary school, it was just enjoy sport. Yeah, I liked sport, and that was it. It wasn't. All of my other mates were in Sunday league teams. Mm. I never played Sunday League till I was 11. Okay, so that's probably part of it then because mm. those kids get snapped up so young now, don't yeah. they, mm. if you've been playing? I wasn't in the shop window for any club. No. Mm. Unless someone's filming me in my back garden or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like That's the only way they're going to see see me play. Yeah. Because that's all I'd do. I'd get home from school, train in the garden, that was it. It's mad. And you got good from that. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's not quite the same, but we've got a, a girl who plays for our women's team now, Malika. She's an unreal player. And she didn't play, uh, like, organised football until she was, like, 20 mm. she just played in the garden of her family yeah and then you know okay women's football like maybe you can have a slightly faster trajectory there's less levels to to, to climb mm -hmm. but like she not only turned up just a joke but she was like got better so quick as mm -hmm. well because you yeah. got so much room yeah to grow because you haven't had all that training yeah well, do you feel like you can still obviously you're gonna still improve anyway you, yeah you're not anywhere near your prime yet but do you think you can improve quicker than other people your age because of that definitely years ago it was like because a lot of people just start an academy at six and they get to 16, mm. they've, done, they've done 10 years of like, not full-time football, but pretty much full-time football in a professional environment. Yeah. They get to 16, it's like, it's basically you've had a career. Yeah. Mm. You've had a 10 year career and it's either make or break. Mm. And then when it breaks and they drop a couple of levels, the motivation isn't there to like, yeah. to go back up. Non-league's littered with players yeah. like that. I've seen it? a yeah. lot of players do that where they drop off. They're like, oh my God, I've, I've dedicated 10 years of my life for this. And they're, not, and they're not made it. Yeah. They're not made it. Where I was on the up, like start at eleven, enjoyed Sunday league, literally no pressure, just enjoying Sunday league. And when it gets to that, which in, even in my mind it wasn't make or break, it was just make 
Like, yeah. It wasn't break for me. It was like, mm. all right, I'll just go and yeah, yeah. enjoy it. Like you said, said your identity it. wasn't wrapped up in football. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, I think we look at it probably now as like parents as well, Seb, and we think about, you know, what if our kids are going to do any sport and stuff. And, you know, if you're, if you're desperate for your kid to be a footballer, you might make them start doing silly amounts of hours from three, four years project old. And like, yeah, Project uh, yeah, yeah. Like if you're If that's your thing, if you're like, you know, uh, Richard Williams, I think his name is, the Serena and Venus's dad, mm-hmm. like you're... You you make you make a fifty page dossier about their career and had them mm. grinding hours and hours a day. The thing that scares me about ever doing that with my kids is like if they don't make it, you've taken their childhood. Well, they away. never yeah. make movies about them ones, do they? No, that's the, the thing. They don't. How yeah. many children's yeah. lives have been shattered by yeah. false self esteem because they're yeah. pushed into something? How many people didn't become Tiger Woods or Venus Williams or Serena mm. Williams? So. And the, the route you took, if you were designing it, would be the perfect route for your yeah. child to do. Yeah, but yeah. the only problem is you're relying on your kid being just like a, a natural talent, yeah. which I think is what I would class you as. Yeah. Like, not, I don't actually believe in natural talent in the sense of you're born with it, but I think you have basic things like coordination and things and you work on that. And, and some people have an ability to sort of compound that really quickly. I think 10,000 hour thing comes to mind, right? So mm-hmm. these kids that you're talking about, these 16 year olds, they've done their 10,000 hours by yeah. 16. You definitely wouldn't have, certainly yeah. not in an organized environment. No, no. So that means you wouldn't, be classed as a child prodigy in these Wayne Rooney's that mm-hmm. do what they do at 16. Yeah. But it does mean you can peak late and yeah. you can keep going. You and I think the mental out. part of it's yeah. huge, yeah. So that's the plan. Yeah. That's what we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, listen, I'm so excited to see where you go next. You know, you you were you were at Northampton. You you got loaned out a couple of times, didn't you? Or you went to St. Neots. St. Neots. Neots. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying it right. St. Neots. St. Neots, yeah. St. Yeah. Saint, Saint Neots. St. Neots, yeah. Which at the time were a step three to club. Yeah. So the same level hashtag right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was on loan from Northampton. Yeah, that was with the youth team. You were at the youth team. So towards, because how it works with the youth team, you play a season August till Jan. Right. As the Merit League, as it's called. And then it splits. So the top six go in to meet the other top six of another area. But a lot of the time, clubs will put pretty much their second years out on loan. Okay. Give them experience and then see if they're good enough for a contract. Was that the year that you were absolutely tearing it up in the in the academy? Like, yeah, 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 the numbers great, were just yeah. crazy. We had a great you were top scoring that, that was, as well, weren't you? You were playing like, sixteen goals yeah. as well. What well. position were you playing? Midfield, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. Yeah. I remember all that and we saw some clips and stuff from it and it was just like, okay. So they probably thought, right, we need to get you out adult football. Men's football, yeah. just to see in their I don't know, but in their mind they might have thought, Okay, we're gonna give him a contract, but let's just see a couple of months whether he's good enough. So what was that like? Because you've gone now from playing Sunday football, like you say, hashtag like with a load of random guys. Then you've gone to Northampton's sort of academy setup. Yeah. Suddenly you're in a non-league environment. Yeah. Very different, right? I remember the first game. And bearing in mind, there was only probably 700 people there. It's not bad. We'll take that. Which is <laughs> still all right. But I remember we scored a last minute goal to win 1-0. And that was the first time I get that like mm. buzz of, oh my God. Looking at the fans, you like, mean something. Yeah, yeah. He's hugging points. me. They don't even know me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like debut this game, yeah, debut on this game, and they're hugging me, and like I can see the the happiness it brings, and that was step three. Yeah, I think they were like mid table or towards the bottom, so obviously it was a massive like result, and that was the first time I felt, oh my god, like this. And you is were what 17, 18? You were 17, 17. 17, yeah. So you're probably youngest player there. Yeah. It, 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 basically, what Ted Curd is for us now, yeah. seventeen. Yeah. And um, what were the players like? Did they welcome you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. good lads. Yeah. Like, was it, because I mean, I don't know what it was like at that club, but a lot of non league clubs, it's sort of, sort of, maybe less so now. I think players are a bit more serious with athlete, mm. athletic behavior, but earlier years, it was a lot of drinking culture and stuff, and you yeah. weren't even been old enough to do that. No. So you was wondering, these youngsters come in, like, how, how much can they get involved? But they mm. looked after you. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of older lads are always wary, like, oh, yeah. this youth team's coming in from a big, like, Northampton, mm. like, He's gonna take my place, all right. Let's see what he's see what he's about. And then as soon as I think the whistle went, like a couple of nice touches, passes, a few dribbles, and then I think they they were like, okay. So this is where I do think hashtag dude should get a little bit of credit here because so many and I know this for a fact, mm. so many players at your age would not have ever played adult football. Mm. Yeah. And even I'm not saying the standard was anything like step three. Mm. But you had done that with us, mm-hmm. not only a handful of times, but yeah. still you'd gone up against people double your age. Yeah. In, in, in play, we played in centre mid, we played you out wide, we played yeah. you a couple of positions, and like again things like the Wembley Cup, like yeah, they're all adults. Again, not all this, that level, but if you can handle that, thirty thousand yeah. people, you can handle seven hundred. Yeah, and I think that that is just. I think there's a region Pochettino's no trust in us with Ted, isn't there? 
Yeah, like, it's, a great, it's, a great, to... it's a great opportunity, especially now. Like, so I think that is, you're right. I think there is a mm. great, what it's been able to um, create is that environment. Like, what a great opportunity for us to play in front of 34,000 people. Like, right. life, I've still got it as my bloody pin tweet. I probably will have the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things. But for you at 16 to get a taste for that yeah. and then to build on that platform. Because one thing we've missed very quickly uh, yes, here, was Mark Bright was commentating that day, presenting it. He's yeah. also been involved in Palace. He spoke to the guys at Crystal Palace. Well, like, this, this guy's got start, his pee. You want to check him out? It started before that. And this is another piece of evidence of how much I backed you before that game. Is So Mark White commentates the, foot, the games, like you say. And like, I'd known him quite well by this point because he'd done three of them. So he would always ring me before and ask me who to know, who he should know about because he wouldn't be familiar with the YouTube players. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, Chris MD's got a bit and all this sort of thing. <laughs> and I'd go, but... You only need to know one name. I so said, you need to know the name Scott Pollock. Mm -hmm. And he was like, all right. And like, he was rolling his eyes. I was like, no, listen, like, you know, I, I've never told you like any of these guys are serious players. I've never said this YouTuber is going to go pro or whatever. I've, I've always told you they're good, relatively speaking. I said, but this kid like actually could. And I said, if you've got anything about you, you'll invite him to a trial at Crystal Palace. And he was like, okay, man. <laughs> got anything about you? <laughs> Honestly, me and, Mark, me and Mark talk all the time. Right, if you're watching this, you know. And then obviously you do Good what you do in the Mark. final. Yeah. He, he rings me up and he goes, yeah, we should talk about yeah. that trial. <laughs> yeah. And so what, what I happened? remember in the, in the interview, the man of the match interview, he was like, he was kind of asking a few questions like, oh, you, so you're playing for anyone? How old are you again? Like, mm. I mean, I don't think he said then, but yeah, afterwards he was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, obviously Bright is a Palace legend and he's very involved over there. Like, he's a big part of the club, right, especially with the academy. Mm. He is a great guy. But um, what was that process like? So you went down there again, you'd have been 16. Yeah. What did they do? You're on trial. What does that even mean? Like, Yeah, so there was a few other trialists um, invited for that week, but they had a they had a big squad at the time. Okay. I think the 18s were with, it was like the 17s and 16s, because when I was there, it was like half term as well. Right. So a lot of the 16s were there which I guess helped me kind of integrate a bit better because a lot of them were like mm. two or three years older than me. Yeah. So it was even hard enough impressing a Premier League club. Yeah, Premier League. With 18s and 19s. And I think even one of the trial games, it was like 21, 22 year olds. So like people six years older and I'm trying to impress yeah. over them. So you think was, you got goal and assist, didn't you? One of the in games? the first game, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really is it, that's the thing. I, I knew that jump was, I mean, that's the thing. We've got to be realistic as well, right? Because like we know a lot more now, and I certainly know a lot more about the levels through what we've done the last five yeah. years of hashtag than I did then. But we're talking about literally non, not even non-league and mm. A, not in a league team mm. to the top tier league in the world. Yeah. So it's a massive jump. So yeah. you could have gone on that trial and mm. you could have come back and you could have gone like, oh mate, they were so good. And I'd have been yeah. like, fair enough, let's yeah. see where else we can pitch you in. Mm -hmm. But understanding is you did pretty well on that trial like, and we, I don't know if we can find it because it's years ago but we actually sent Lewis down with yeah. that thing we got some footage mm. so what was your impression post that like you know I, I can't relate to in the football terms but one thing mm. we thought about I was thinking about when we were talking about what you did at the Wembley Cup because yeah. I was thinking about how I used to do stand-up comedy and how I always think that was the best preparation for me to do all this stuff mm -hmm. because if you can go and do stand-up in front of people and try and make them laugh and you learn more from the bad gigs than the good gigs yeah. when they don't laugh and you're like you want the world to swallow you up yeah. If it didn't happen much, but if you, if you can do that, then everything else is easy yeah. when it comes to presenting. It's yeah. like, I don't, I've never been nervous for presenting mm -hmm. ever because I did that. Mm -hmm. So I think the same for you when you've done Wembley Cup 34,000 people. Yeah, what, 700? Yeah. It's the same for this. It's like, this trial reminds me a little bit of like some of the auditions I used to go on and you'd, yeah. you'd think if it auditioned to be a presenter or auditioned to be whatever and you'd think, oh, I nailed that. I, I, you know, you get your hopes up maybe, like actors go through this all the time and you don't get the phone call. You do get yeah. the phone call and it's bad news. Like, did you leave thinking something was going to come of it? I think I probably didn't grasp the whole situation as much as I should have. Okay, what well, in terms of how you? In terms of, I was still wanting to like impress, and like, I was hungry for it. But I, I remember a few times I took a little bit of a back off. I was like, okay, some of these are right. Some of these are really good, and they've been there for years. And I think even being like a London team, you get a lot of like more hungry players than you on the pitch okay and coming into a new environment it was like you're not scared or not like not too nervous but you're like okay well i don't want to you maybe showed him a bit too much respect a little bit too yeah. much respect yeah and so is that would you say that's a regret i mean not to you say you should have a regret because you've yeah. gone on another career but do you think it could have been different if you'd done something different yeah not a regret because i still enjoyed the experience and like you said with your stand-up that was probably my stand-up yeah for, mm trying with the youth team okay and when it came to trying mm. with the youth team i wasn't nervous it was like all right yeah everyone else here even though you're already part of the academy i've got an equal chance to yeah. impress yeah, yeah, as well yeah. so 
I it's it's like start doing step overs with ankle weights on. You take them yeah. off, and it's like yeah. I think it's mm. such good advice for anyone watching this, not even football related. Like go and try and do the hardest thing you can think you could ever do. The thing yeah. that scares you the most, and then the ev- rest of your life, yeah. everything will be easy. That, that probably helped me get into the academy because it was. Well, I remember a friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, you played with him at hashtag. Uh, Real name Hussein Issa, but Tekka's guru, as we used to know, who's now, by the way, set piece coach at Arsenal, which is so cool, right? Yeah. And did a very good job from what I hear. He knew the guys at Palace, or he knew some involvement at Palace. And he said to me, before you went there, they ain't mm-hmm. going to take him because yeah. they only take massive physical guys. Yeah. And I was like, well, that'd be a shame if that, and I'm not saying that's true, by the way, like, but mm-hmm. that was on this impression that they had a bit of a reputation yeah. for that was how they recruited. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of teams that have done that famously. Yeah. Did you feel that when well, you were there? I was probably the smallest there. Really? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, I think there was like either the extreme of tiny, really technical, yeah. like ridiculously technical, or mm. massive. And big units. But yeah. you were 16 and there was lads older than you as well. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. you've grown since then. Yeah. So, so that's where like, I probably yeah. gave them a little bit too much respect. Like, okay, mm. looking at the size of everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I don't fit in here. Right, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, so you kept bounced back from that. Obviously, went to your stuff at Northampton, got through there, went on loan, came back. They, like you say, got promoted to League One, mm-hmm. had the game against Rooney, some epic stuff. How would you sum up your time at Northampton? Because it's like your boyhood club in many ways, yeah. isn't it? Like, yeah. I think you're a Leicester fan as well, though, aren't you? Family, yeah, yeah. Family, like, club, yeah. Actual club, less in terms of supporting a club, Leicester. Yeah. When they won but the I league. Was always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah, you're Northampton's your local team. Yeah, yeah. And you got yeah. to play for them. Yeah. Like, and so how did that come to an end, your time at Northampton? What was what was the process? Uh, so, yeah, the, the last season I was there, I didn't play too much. Okay. It was kind of new manager come in, which was actually my youth team manager. So all a lot right. of the time you expect, all right, mm. like, you're young, you're like, youth team manager comes in, had a good relationship and stuff like that. You just expect to play, which is obviously not the case in, when it comes to professional football. It's like people's careers on the line. Yeah, there's and, no friends, yeah. You no, know, first managerial season for him as well so okay. it's obviously a lot of pressure but also what a massive change from being a promotion chasing team yeah when you can try things like try youngsters out and give them a chance yeah. to suddenly every game you lose you could get sacked yeah like you know it doesn't allow for experimentation does yeah it? yeah so after that season it was kind of um didn't play as much as i'd like to still started a couple of games and scored a goal um yeah scored a goal that season but just didn't was unlucky, the... I remember you scored that goal and you got into the side yeah. and then it looked like you were going to get a run in the team and playing yeah. well. And then you got that like that wound, didn't you? You got like a stud on your ankle, was it? Uh, that was the season before. That was the season, season before, before, was it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It seems to me that you got like unlucky with like, he's in the team now yeah. and then someone would come back yeah. and at the time... That was just like never... COVID as well. Yeah, exactly. And I had a COVID, great run yeah, of course. just before COVID yes, happened. That's it, yeah. And there was a few injuries and we had Forrest Green on the Saturday. And then I was like, well, I'm going to start. We've got no midfielders fit. And yeah. I've played like the last three games and then got announced on the Friday, right? Everything oh, yeah. shut down. Wounded. I mean, COVID's got a lot to answer for um, <laughs> it, with football, young footballers, yeah. for sure. Because mm-hmm. a lot of footballers, that just that was the period where they got released yeah. and they didn't get to play for a year. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it just killed their careers. Mm-hmm. Like, luckily it didn't do that for you. Yeah. So so your contract came to an end at Northampton. Yeah. And so you'd, you'd been on loan at Boston already, hadn't you? Yeah, in Feb, Feb March time. So they'd loaned you out to Boston, who yeah. were National League North at that North, time as well. Yeah. And you're obviously impressed there because when they got the chance to, they snapped you up on a on a permanent transfer. Yeah. So what? So first loan, when you went there, did you think this might be somewhere that I'd come back? Yeah, I remember the first game out on loan. It was like a bit of a relief. I was starting. It was a great ground there, good fans, decent level as well, and it was a bit of a derby match, Boston versus Kettering. So it was like mm. I think there was probably three thousand five hundred or something there, like massive game. Wow. And I've waited a, a long time to actually get the opportunity to start a game. So literally first 10 minutes, I think a cross came in, header, scored already on my debut. I was like, okay, this is this is nice. Like, Loves it. He's, ended he's up winning man for the big occasion, up, isn't he? Steps ended up. up winning the game and they were pushing for promotion as well. So I was like, this is a good club. I felt quite respected there and it was a good time. Then I got recalled four weeks later back to Northampton okay. to start because I had a few injuries. So... That's where it first came about with Boston. It's worth pointing out for our American viewers as well. This is not Boston yeah, yeah. in America. Yeah. This is Boston in England. Every chance Boston in America was named after Boston in England, to be honest. Like, yeah. you know, so just to know your role. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think when I watch this stuff from afar, like, you know, and I obviously keep up to date with your career and we chat every now and then, but it's so nice when I see like Scott Pollock on the, on the score sheet and stuff and we just think everyone's getting to see what we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for you, you've, you've played in Northampton in the, in the EFL. You've come out. 
you've gone on loan and then permanently signed National League North. Yeah. You've then had an unbelievable season National League North. And we've almost caught up now to how you went to Yeovil. But my question for you is, because you're still young, right? And you haven't had like enough time in terms of multiple seasons back to back of playing loads of games to know really where you level out. Mm. Like, and, and you probably are going to still get better once you get yeah, those games definitely. under your belt. Yeah. So like, what's your ambition? Like, what is, what, you've played the levels, you know, when you came out of EFL and you went, we, we've seen the goals, the stats yeah. don't lie. Mm. So like, you're not, I, I know you're not a National League North player, like, mm. or South player. You're definitely ceilings higher because what you've done. Now, things happen in timings, you know, injuries and whatever. Yeah. But what's, what's your aim? I think obviously after this injury, have a good full season again of playing. Yeah. Like that Boston one was probably the first time I've played, I think it was like 42 games, even with the injury. 42 yeah. games of like 90 minutes competitive football. So another season like that or two and then take me to back to the EFL, I think. Yeah. It's got to be, isn't it? It's got to be. So, yeah. When he's yeah, played there at a younger age, yeah. Not now had the chance to improve since then, get a run of games, yeah. I think you'll find that I wouldn't want to put a level on you, mate. To be no, honest, yeah. I wouldn't put a level. Not your age, definitely. As well. I think when you've shown that at a young, as a younger man, you're being competitive in a very good Northampton side, mm. and you've got so much bigger physically since then. Yeah, you know, that really the grown yeah, up yeah. strong. I remember one time I hadn't seen you in a few months. I was like, Jesus Christ, mm. there's like another of you where uh, you've got yeah, just, yeah. all of a sudden just manned up, sort yeah. of thing. Just found his man strength. So yeah, I think definitely. But um, so it's very exciting, mate. Like so good now to be feeling at that point where I finally got to the bottom of what this silly bit mm -hmm. of bone was yeah. to have you now so close. I mean, as we film this now, you're going back down to Yeovil tomorrow mm -hmm. to see the physios down there and finalise that plan to be yeah. returned to, to full fitness. And whether it's going to be at Yeovil or another club, like there's there's an unbelievable player that someone's going to get. And I'll say this even though you're next to me, but it's not just about a player. Mm -hmm. When I've spoke to various clubs, it's, it's, the, it's the man you're getting as well, which is mm -hmm. so key. There's so many players that have got the talent but then let themselves down with their application or their mm. attitude. That's one thing you can't really teach. You know, you look at some of the players that, you know, hasn't worked out for like the likes of like Ravel Morrison, the unbelievable talent. Alex Ferguson saying he's one of the best players he's ever had, but just wasn't able to apply that talent. We know you've got the talent, you've proved it, but one thing you've definitely got, mate, is you've got the most unbelievable attitude and your, your dedication to your craft. Like I know how hard you work in between when you've had these, these injuries to get yourself in that condition, the way you look after your diet, all these different things. So... I'm very excited about the future, mate. Yeah, and yeah, also, right. to add to that, I know it's like been quite difficult for you to get the help you need with this injury. I know, I think St. George's Park, you've been down to a bit. Yeah, I mean, PFA yeah, have helped as well. There. Yeah, yeah. So, like, shout out to them, by the yeah, way, absolutely. like helping yeah. players when they need it. Like, it's really important. And, um, yeah, like, I can imagine a lot of people have just gone like, oh, you know, I can't be bothered with this. Like, it's a hassle. Yeah. Like, your work ethic is clear to see. And even little things, like, obviously, I've got a twisted view on it, but even when we did things like the next level league and Scott would come down to play in that, yeah, like, yeah, it's just, yeah. he was always there when, we, when, when people needed him. So, listen, we've got very high hopes for you. I do want to still pivot this in the direction of what this podcast is supposed to be about, which mm -hmm. is how to run a football team. So, I yeah. want to pick your brains. Like, mm -hmm. you've been at a number of clubs. You don't have to name the clubs or anything, but, yeah. like, what are some of the the best environments you've been in like, and why are they good? Like, you know, what are the factors as a player that make being at a club fun? I think a lot of it comes from like the manager's culture. Okay. And when I was young at Northampton, I probably didn't realize at the time how good some of the cultures were, mm. when, especially the older players, the way they speak to you as well as a young player. I now understand it being a bit older, what they're trying to do. Yeah. Because it, it might seem that they're being quite harsh on you. Yeah. Which is kind of going out of the game a little bit. But if they are more harsh on you, it's probably because they like you. Yeah. They want you to do well. If they see a player and they're like, right, he's not going to make it. It's they're not going to waste their time him. on him. No, Dev says the same thing. He always says, yeah. like, if I'm criticising you, it's because I think you can be good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, they're wasting their breath on you to develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If they couldn't be bothered that, like, with your yeah. career and stuff, they just leave you alone. And you think... When you talk about the manager's culture, yeah. how important is having the right players in the dressing room in that? And do you think like sometimes managers just get lucky or do you think it's like almost an exact science where they go, right, I need a player who's a bit more of a leader. I need a player who's, you know, a bit of a joker and gets yeah. everyone happy. Like how important are those dynamics? I'd say under my, my first professional contract was under Keith Curl. Okay. Who for me was a great manager for me as a youngster, gave me a lot of chances. And he brought in a few of his players that's, been at his clubs before mm. so he knew the, how they'd run the dressing room yeah they knew his ethics and stuff like that so he knew that they were going to buy into his philosophy and then he brought in a couple of old players one of them like Nicky Adams who was great to have around the dressing room especially for the youngsters as well so 
they kept everything in check. Yeah. And that's probably why we went up that season. What do you think is more damaging for a team? A, a, a I say bad manager, I don't say manager's are bad, but the wrong manager at the yeah. wrong club, but with a great dressing room. Yeah. Or a good manager, but the dressing room is a problem. He's lost it or there's a there's a toxic person in there. Like what's going to affect things more, do you think? Because there's a bit of a school of thought in the modern sort of data-led approach to football. And I've read a lot mm -hmm. about this. Like with exceptions, obviously, where you've got top tier, like world-class managers. But yeah. often there's a lot of statistically that managers don't actually make that big an impact. Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously they do on a personal level, which is why I, why I think managers are super important with like mm. the way they make the players feel and who, who they want to work for and mm -hmm. how they... How they uh, address issues that come up as well. I think it's a massive mm -hmm. part of it. But statistically, like when new managers come in, you get the new manager bounce, all these things, like it's just levels out across clubs. Yeah. And it's actually just a handful of people, of geniuses really, that actually change the club overnight. But if you get a, the wrong player in there, it can yeah. undo all that good work, can't it? Yeah, I've seen it a few times with players not getting on board with the manager. And it, it does rub off on a lot of other players. Especially when everyone's not like united together. Some players does their own thing and then other players feel like mm. they can get away with that. Mm. And then if the play if the manager's not being strict on the players for doing that, it kind of loses a bit of mm. that's what we got like with Ten Hag at United. Now yeah. he's trying to throw the book at people like Sancho because he's yeah. kind of questioned his authority. Mm. But then like if Sancho doesn't play ball, he just doesn't play. And then you've got yeah. a problem which you've got this guy on loads of money, he's not playing because he's got an attitude issue or yeah. at least a clash. We don't know if it's Sancho or Ten Hag, really. Mm. But that is, sometimes it feels like it becomes untenable for the manager to the mm -hmm. point where as soon as he starts losing, he's going to go yeah. because the players are on these contracts. And they, there's so much yeah. player power now, right? Yeah. Like you didn't grow up in that era. We grew up in the era where like, maybe you've got the back end of it, where like Sir Alex Ferguson was hair dry treatment, kicking boots at Beckham and like yeah. didn't even get in trouble. Nowadays, he'd probably go, he'd probably go to court. Yeah, minimum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd lose yeah. his job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'd lose his job. HR, yeah, 100%. Right over it, yeah. Yeah. But like that was normal. There's some amazing videos. I can't remember the manager's name. Neil Knight might remember. Who's that manager? He was like, you can bring your dinner. John Sitton. He's late in Orient, wasn't he? He's late in Orient. So there's a manager. There's a great video on YouTube if yeah. you haven't seen it. He's literally offering all the players out. After mm. He's saying, so, so, I'll fight you all. Yeah, yeah. And like, you just couldn't, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but there used to be a lot more mm. manager power mm -hmm. and players were basically a bit scared, I think. Yeah. Now we've probably gone the other way, which is managers really probably can't do what they need to do sometimes to get yeah. authority. Yeah. Like, is, what is the right balance there? I'd always say when, whether they mean it or not, but if a manager acts, like shows their confidence in all their players, they'll get the best out of the team. Mm, okay. When they're not as honest and they're kind of a bit half-hearted of telling the truth, it's kind of like you lose a bit of that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if a manager's like, just says it how it is, but still in a way that gives the team confidence, then you'll get a lot of the players on board. There's consistency in what yeah. you're saying, like yeah, his yeah. approach and not yeah. doing one thing for one person. And if, yeah, I think that's yeah. a really good point. And then what, because obviously a lot of this podcast can be about like uh, board level stuff. You know, we talk about to owners of clubs and things yeah. like that. How much does that impact players on the pitch? Like, are you aware? Of, do you have relationships with your owners at the clubs you've been at? Like, you know, obviously hashtags, I'm very hands on. I'm literally commentating in the stands and the players will know me. Mm -hmm. But professional clubs, yeah, it's not quite like that, is it really? The ones I've been at, they've, the chairmans and the owners have been quite like social with the players. Okay, and stuff. nice. Especially at Boston, the uh, the chairman there would come in after the game. He'd sort of greet all the players as we're having like our post match food and stuff. Yeah, and he'd come down in the bar and have a chat and talk about the game and stuff, which is nice to feel like you've got a connection with them. Yeah. And at Northampton, the chairman there uh, was you'd just think he's like a normal kind of guy. You wouldn't think he's like too like a big ego or anything mm. or too much of himself like to just not see the players and that he would talk yeah. to you like a normal person but I, I always think the way it should work is like the chairman or the owner they work with the managers right yeah. and like whatever for higher levels maybe you've got directors of football and things but not so much in non-league and like that's where that communication happens and that's where the analysis and the cri any criticism or whatnot has to happen. And then everything beneath that should be the manager, yeah. which actually allows the owner to have those relationships with players yeah. and to be that guy because mm -hmm. you're like, well, I don't need to discuss anything like critical or anything with you because no. I'll talk to the manager about that. Yeah. And that's why manager sometimes the bad guy and sometimes mm -hmm. takes the brunt of all the blame things or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, have you been at, you've been at a club where managers have changed? Do you mean sacked? And yeah, like so new managers come in. Yeah, yeah. yeah so like... Yeah. How important is like that first day, a new manager? Do they have to sort of really say, you know, this is me, this is what I'm about, quite authoritatively, or it, it, can it be like so bad that 
that if they get it wrong early doors, it's they can't come back from it? Well, I think what I've experienced is they, well, the best way of doing it that I've experienced is coming in and not being, it sounds weird, not being too like authoritative with what their things are to begin with. Observing. Okay. I remember, I think it was, it might be Keith Curl that came in and said, pressure's not on you, it's on me. So like, you go and just play freely. All the pressure's on me. So he's not coming in like, right, we need to do this, this, mm. which for all the players are like, oh shit, like, I don't know what I'm not You can swear, yeah, yeah, yeah go yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not 2016 yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, yeah, oh shit. No, this is, um, this is serious now. We need to win. Like, we have to win this game. Yeah. Where if a manager comes in like, boys, the pressure's on me, not on you. Yeah, you've got your contract. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's brought, the thing. It's quite yeah. paralyzing sometimes, that pressure, isn't it? Like, that's what I always think about when you see, this is slightly off topic, but, you know, West Ham got smashed by Fulham recently and supposedly it was because, because we've been in really good form, mm. but it was supposedly because there was this illness going around the camp and it just makes you think, like, the margins at that level, mm. one little thing yeah. affects mm. it. And I always think mm. with players' mindsets, like, why yeah. can one player be so inconsistent or why can it be so good one week and so bad next week? And there's so many mm. things that can affect it. Yeah. The big thing I don't think gets talked about anywhere near enough, and I think the Deli Alley piece this year was mm. really good for this, mm-hmm. is like just they've got their own lives. Footballers yeah. have got stuff going yeah. on. They might have had I mean, there's a lad at Burnley who's been who's been off Foster, I think yeah. his name is yeah. with mental health Foster, stuff yeah. like it's like, you know, it almost feels like as a society, we, we've got much better at that stuff now. But in mm-hmm. football, it's almost like, oh, yeah, but footballers need to play. Yeah, <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? It's yeah, like, yeah, well, yeah. why is he any different than yeah, someone working yeah. in your office that has a mental yeah, health issue? Yeah, yeah. And, or, or they can't have a mental health issue because they get loads of money and, you know, they yeah, should be that's really... the one I, That's the one I always hate seeing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, well, I've seen it recently with Reese James. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Done another post, obviously. Unfortunately, I've been injured quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I see some of the comments like, how can he be devastated? I'd be injured earning 200 grand a week. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's irrelevant. No, these yeah. guys have spent 20 years of their life yeah. to play football, yeah. like, mm-hmm. to be in this moment, and they got, they can't do it. Yeah, It's agony. Yeah, And people don't realise, I don't think, the mental health issues people do get when they're injured, particularly. Yeah. Like, when they're out of football for a long time, like can yeah. be really, really damaging. Yeah. Um, particularly if you're someone that's like handled it a lot through their career. Yeah. you know. But yeah. I think we are getting a bit better as a society, slowly yeah. but surely, and we get coming around to that stuff. Mm-hmm. The other thing as well that people, you know, they, they kind of will look at you and they go, you're a footballer. Yeah. Which you are. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, you're not earning Premier League money. No. Do you know what I mean? Like, no. you know, that there's a level, and I don't know where it is exactly, but it's in, in non-league, you know, where, for example, if hashtag one day were to go professional, you know, players would have to make a decision because going professional means we're full-time, means we yeah. need you to be full-time. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean we're going to pay you more than your current job does. No. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. that's the reality of life. League, mm-hmm. We're not even talking about League 2, we're talking about National League teams being professional. Like, people are playing football at that level, they deserve a lot of credit, in my opinion, because they often have turned down other careers. I remember mm-hmm. you were talking about being an architect one day. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, can they make a lot of money being an architect. Yeah. Like, and you have to park things. And with our level, I think a lot about it. I think it's one of the hardest levels you could play because... Obviously, there's high levels of football, but you're asking guys to have a professional mentality whilst sometimes working manual labor jobs, mm. you know, 12 hour days on, yeah. on, a, on, a, on a site. Mm. And then they come and play a game of football where, you know, it's a proper level. Mm. Like that is, I'm not saying Premier League players have it easy because they don't. They, what yeah. they have to put their bodies through and the levels yeah. they have to maintain are yeah. a joke. But it's nicer when you can just go, I'm a footballer yeah. and I don't need to do anything else but be good on the weekend and yeah. like be fit and be ready. Mm-hmm. And lower league players, I think you have a lot more to deal with because yeah. the finances aren't yeah. as good. The balance like two jobs, family, if you've got kids as well and the travelling as well. Yeah, the travelling is national. Yeah. It's still national, yeah. Which is not a, a dig at Premier League players but I've seen a lot of players come out saying we play too many games and, yeah. a, and a lot of non-league people have come out saying, well, you fly here, you get picked up by the coach, you're not driving three hours to an away mm-hmm. game coming back three hours or training at night, getting mm-hmm. back at 12 o'clock to get up at 7 a.m. to go on site or something. Yeah. Brick, brick lay or something. No, that yeah, is that yeah, is yeah. why I think it's so hard yeah. to be an only footballer. I think, I do hear what Klopp and the guys are saying because I think that ultimately it's more like, it's not so much, that, it's basically they're getting judged on the results to such a level yeah. of like, that, that you know, with the money that's on the line and people's careers are on the line, not just footballers. That do we? It's more about these extra competitions that keep coming up. So, like, yeah. do we need you know the Club World Cup to be a thirty-two team tournament, or do we need whatever it's going to be? So, yeah, I, I hear, I, I see both sides of it, but I do think that non-league guys and, and lower-level professional players, mm-hmm. they uh, they really do earn their money, like, and, and they could get you know, they could be paid more. That's where England's so weird, and if we feel this at hashtag right, like 
there's so much money so low down the pyramid. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't make sense. No. Like to, for the people, money people can earn at the level hashtag are at is mm-hmm. mad. Yeah. Not only in our club, mm. but they can earn it at other clubs. And you're like, in any other walk of life, you go, it's seventh division. Yeah. Like mm. you can't be in the divisions that, you know, objectively people care about for four or five years. Mm. Why are you spending this much money now? Yeah. But they're so desperate to get there yeah. and, and for the journey. But it doesn't make sense. They can't generate the money they're spending. It's not possible. So that is something that will always come up, I think, on this podcast. But you touched on it there. I want to like pay, take one word from every person as regards to, you know, what I think makes a good football club. Mm. And you, you, you're welcome to add another one. But yeah. you said culture, and I think that's a really good one. Like, yeah. it, it comes from the manager. I do think it comes from the owners as well, because the owners ultimately appoint the manager. Mm-hmm. And if you appoint a manager who's got a certain approach, and maybe that approach is, is you know, not one that goes down very well with players, I think the the owners have some responsibility for that too, right? Yeah. So like. If you are under a manager you enjoy, mm-hmm. there is someone else that's made a decision for that yeah. person to be there. But mm-hmm. culture, is that the most important thing for you? So culture and confidence. Confidence. Mm-hmm. Within his team. For the manager to have confidence. Manager yeah. within his team, yeah. And it's part of it, yeah, it's part of it, isn't it? Yeah. Like his whole his whole package or her whole package yeah, as yeah. manager. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a lot to think about and how many ways people can Im- Im- impact a club. But before we let you go, mm-hmm. you've got any advice for us? You know, we're trying to get to level that you're playing at. Mm-hmm. What do we, and I know you're sort of fairly familiar with you keep you keep up to date with our results and stuff. Mm-hmm. What do you think we need to do to make that step up? To be fair, I think the way you've gone about it is the right step because I've seen a lot of clubs that obviously chuck money, they swap managers every season, like Salford for example. They haven't kept a manager, I don't think, for past two years or something like that. Because they're, they're so keen on getting to that next yeah. level, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, we are too. And I think we've just done it. But you've done it steady. It's like yeah, we've done it you've steady. not put the pressure on right. Like for AFC Fylde, for example, they had League 2 2023 24 on their sleeve for a while. I don't know if you've seen oh, that. Oh, really? Well, just, they had a badge on their sleeve, as in obviously with an aim. Yeah. Right? But they put a lot of pressure on getting to a certain That's level. That's mad. Well, mm-hmm. I think you've gone about it in a steady way. From what I've seen, anyway, of like yeah, we're trying, outside I mean, certainly the club, financially it's... we have. Yeah, but I do wonder. I'd love to get your take on it because as a player, like we preach sustainability nonstop, mm. and we like we've got you know, it's very fan focused, and we want to be around. But as a player, do you not like? And this isn't like you know, this is genuine question. Mm. Yeah, that environment is going to be more hospitable and probably more stable. Mm-hmm. But is it also like people that went to Billy Ricky, for example, under Glenn Tamplin, when he was just throwing money at people, yeah. like? Do you not a little them little bit of them not love that? They're like, we're here, we're getting paid way too much money, mm. like by a certain club under the wrong manager or the wrong owner, whatever. Is that a bad thing for players if, if they get paid? It can be, yeah. Why? So, I think well, the hunger might go a little bit for mm. some players. Their personality might go right, money, that's it. Yeah. And the love of it goes a little bit. That's probably why it gets players on the way out, like, yeah. doesn't it? Like later years of yeah, their yeah. life. Yeah. Because I just wonder what the player... Because I, I have an idea of what our non-league boys are like. Obviously, I know our players pretty well. Mm-hmm. But I think when you get into like professional football and you get to like particularly high level where their players have got so much money now, mm-hmm. as they're, they're, they're all like multi-multi-millionaires, yeah. right? It's like, and you, know, you get this... I think Ronaldo famously said in the press conference once, they asked him about some big political issue. And he was like, guys, we just talk about girls, cars, and money. He's like, oh, handbags. He's like, that's all we talk about. I don't know how to tell you anything different. And I'm sure that was an overstatement. There are obviously a few more of the intellectual footballers. Mm-hmm. But like, I think partly that is like true to an extent. At the higher levels, and they've got that much money. It's, well, it's very so low impact to them, isn't it? It's just a different no, yeah. culture, they isn't just it? just paid yeah. hundreds of thousands of pounds into their bank every week, even after tax. Like are the Brighton just... players going to each other, oh, our owners are doing such a good job. You know, I love their money ball approach. And it's brilliant. And they keep finding another 18-year-old Colombian. Yeah. Like, or they just go in like, oh, I can get so much more money if I go to City. Mm. Probably a bit of both, isn't it? But I think ultimately they're probably thinking this 18-year-old Colombian is going to take my spot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's probably with them, it's again, it's Brighton is a great club to come to when you're younger, but it is probably viewed as a stepping stone, isn't it? For that reason, they know mm-hmm. if they're really good, they'll get that Carcedo or Cucurella move or whatever. Ultimately, you go to Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> At some yeah. point, you go to yeah. Chelsea. Yeah. That is the move. That's the career trajectory. I'm really happy we got to catch up, Scott. And I, I hope this is only part one mm. of a follow-up we do down the line yeah. when you're playing in this, some of these high levels maybe obviously you've got a job to do at Yeovil first mm-hmm. you know I think um, Yeovil hopefully will go up this year hopefully I'm not jinxing that but top of the league right now mm-hmm. certainly belong at a higher level than they are yeah. right now a massive club and uh, I, I think like 
the journey you've been on so far and what's happened at Yeovil, it would be lovely to see you get a run of games in that team, mm -hmm. show everyone at Yeovil and all those fans what you can do. Because yeah. I think you'll be a fan favourite in no time. I mean, he would, wouldn't he? Absolutely. Just hope he gets that chance, to be honest. That's yeah. been, uh, there's been a bit of a misconception around that. Maybe going to another day has been a, been a bit of a shame. However, Scott is just busting to get back on that. But I can't wait, mate, to get you fully fit, running at people, yeah. scoring goals left, right, yeah, centre. coming. Back in yeah. the FPL team. The other thing people don't <laughs> there, know, there non actually, there non -league non -league FPL, probably, yeah. Is, yeah. probably is. Yeah. The other people don't know is we nearly got you to TST last year. Nearly. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. the Yeovil deal was in the midst at that time, I think. Um, I think you'd just gone to Yeovil. It's over a long period we were talking about it because yeah. obviously we had to confirm yeah. our squads. But um, you'd just gone to Yeovil and it was like a little bit of... You, it was I in that period where it started didn't know to become... Who the owner was, didn't we? It started to become apparent that maybe this ownership thing hadn't quite gone through. Yeah. And we were talking to the what we believe were the owners... And we're saying, would this be a possibility? And they said, absolutely, yes. Gave it to us in writing. And then it sort of transcended that they actually weren't the owner. No, so if they'd, they'd been the yeah. owner, you might have been there. And we probably would have won a million dollars. Probably won a million dollars, mate. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> been... Maybe next time. Well, the, the, the invite's always there. Obviously, yeah. when you're a contracted player, you've got to respect the club. <laughs> yeah, so we're, not, we're not, absolutely. see yeah. if we can make it work. And it goes without saying, we've actually, I've actually said it to you offline before, but... Your career is going to go far, but if anything ever happens, you know there's hashtag United spot waiting for you when yeah. you're ready to we come home. in the league, so... Yeah, yeah we could catch up. Well, exactly. yeah. It's possible. Yeah. If you yeah. weren't where they were, we'd get in the playoffs. You never know, but... No, I don't need a guarantee from you. Mm -hmm. I've got one from Ben Foster. I've had one from Mac uh, yeah. Benoit. But before you retire many, many years from now, yeah. you, you are going to come back at some point. Yeah. No, okay. I, that's, that's, in my mind, I'd, I'd, I'd love to. That's contracted now. Yeah, I love that. Even yeah. if it's your last game as a footballer, minimum, yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. get it done. But uh, fantastic stuff, Scott. Listen, wish you the best. Thanks for coming down. Oh, thanks for And having me. get back on that pitch. Stop bagging them in. Right. That brings us to the end of another episode of How to Run a Football Club. A little bit of a different one, but a really important one. Been great catching up with Scott Pollock. You can keep up to date with his career. Follow him. We'll put the links in the description. Uh, obviously on Instagram. What's your handle on Instagram? Scott underscore Pollock 12. Easy. Yeah. Scott Underboys. What's the 12 yeah. about? Uh, just lucky number. 12, no. Yeah. Has that always been that? Yeah. Never got 77 in the hashtag days. No, no. No. <laughs> I do follow him. I do know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, make sure you're following Scott uh, and get behind him. And also, if you want to watch future episodes of this podcast, drop a like. Let us know you're enjoying it. Let us know in the comments who you'd like to see. And if you're listening, of course, uh, follow us on whatever platform you're on. Leave a rating. If you're feeling really generous, it does help you. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.